Today, I'm really excited because we will be talking with the Natural History Museum's Assistant Curator of Invertebrate Paleontology, Dr. Austin Hendy, about ancient oceans and how those environments and creatures continue to have an impact on our lives to this very day. As a reminder, please feel free to use the chat function if you are logged into the Zoom webinar, and you can submit questions that at the end we'll hopefully have some time to answer. So before we really kick things off, I do want to sincerely thank our partners from Nickelodeon. With their support, the Natural History Museum has been exploring the science of SpongeBob, and all this month my fellow educators and I have been hosting these really awesome kid-friendly conversations with marine scientists and paleontologists diving into a variety of topics ranging from marvelous mammals to fascinating fish and introducing the fossilized ancestors of our favorite SpongeBob characters. And I'm really excited for this one. So let's dive in. So who are we? Who are you hearing from today? This is us, and there is Dr. Austin Hendy. So welcome to another edition of the Science of SpongeBob. My name is Justin Ramos, and I'm a museum educator at the Natural History Museums of Los Angeles County. And today I'm joined by our museum's assistant curator of invertebrate paleontology, Dr. Austin Hendy. There he is right there, folks. Thank you for joining us today. As we time travel, we will travel back in time through the prehistoric seas of Los Angeles and with the help of Dr. Hendy, we will dive deep into what our world looked like uh, hundreds of thousands, if not millions of years ago. I'll try to keep the puns to a minimum, but if not, that's just, that's just who I am. Um, so we will learn more about the history of our ancient oceans and introduce the weird and wonderful ancestors of our favorite SpongeBob characters. And we will also get a glimpse at what Bikini Bottom may have looked like millions and millions of years ago. It's very different from what we know today. Um, and although most of the organisms that we will be introduced to um, may have gone extinct a long time ago, we will see how they can still impact our very lives to this day in 2022. So with that being said, this is Bikini Bottom. This is what Bikini Bottom looks like today. And these were pictures that were uh, taken this year. They might be some places that we're familiar with. We see Patrick's house and Squidward's house, the Tiki head, and of course, you know, who lives in the pineapple under the sea, our eponymous friend, SpongeBob SquarePants. Now, Dr. Hendy, we're all pretty much familiar with what Bikini Bottom looks like today but I'd imagine that it did not always look like this. It didn't always look like what we know. Might we have any sort of idea what Bikini Bottom looked like millions of years ago? Yeah, you know, Justin, that's, that's a great question. That's what I do as a job. I, I think about going back in time and studying how environments have changed and how fossils have changed to where we are today. So. Yeah, marine environments like Bikini Bottom have changed remarkably through time. And in fact, where Justin and I live today has looked remarkably different in the past. Um, our landscapes and coastlines have shifted and plants and animals have evolved. Um, you know, and this might include the movement of continents, uh, parts of continents moving around as a result of, of tectonic activity. Um, Earth has got warmer in some places, colder in others. And, um, you know, there's also changes in the availability of food. Scientists refer to this as productivity or, uh, or nutrient supplies. And an important component of those nutrient supplies are plankton. Huh, plankton. I, I heard you mention plankton, but do you mean like, like this guy here, the character from SpongeBob, the owner of the one and only Chum Bucket? You bet. Plankton is on the menu. Huh. Yeah. It's a term that us scientists use to describe organisms that, that float in the water column. Um, and they include a, a variety of different things. They could be algae, they could be animals, uh, but they provide a crucial source of uh, food to other animals, larger animals, including sponges like SpongeBob, 
five elves and and whales. Hmm. Well, that's very interesting. Now, I was wondering, as we started talking about this, and climate change is on so many people's minds today, as it should be. So how could climate change and environment change impact our friends who live in Bikini Bottom? Yeah, I mean, Earth is always changing for, for natural reasons, natural cycles, but also due to human activity. But if we go back in time, you know, plate tectonics can both create and destroy marine habitats. Uh, climate change is making water temperatures warmer, but in the past, it's got colder. Um, and that allows plants and animals to invade new places where they couldn't live before. Mm -hmm. um, and also it pushes out the animals and plants that once lived there that no longer find that place hospitable. And then changes in productivity can increase food sources. That's usually a good thing, but too much productivity, too many nutrients in the water can be really unhealthy and lead to algal blooms and a lack of oxygen. We all need that. Right. Well, I'm ready to learn about how Bikini Bottom has changed uh, throughout time. But when I think about time in Bikini Bottom, I think about things that happened last year or maybe last month or the time that SpongeBob decided to wear long pants and he had this new sense of confidence and he finally got his license just because he wore long pants. Um, he eventually got it revoked, you know, as is SpongeBob's <laughs> way. But I know that you tend to measure time a little bit differently. And you may not measure it like we would with calendars or watches. Is that right? That's right. Yeah. So first, we need to understand how the geological time scale works. We use geological time. So geological time, uh, what exactly is that? Yeah. So the geological time scale is how geologists and paleontologists divide up the past. Just like on a watch, we have hours, minutes, uh, seconds. Um, geologists need a system for dividing up the past. And, and before geologists determine the exact age of the earth and, and the many important events that took place in earth history, they recognize there are particular layers of rocks um, around the world that contain distinctive fossils. And on that basis, they were able to recognize distinctive geological eras and, and periods. These names that we're familiar with, like the Cretaceous and the Jurassic. And, uh, you know, at a coarse scale, we know that time intervals like the Paleozoic and, and the Cambrian in particular are characterized by really cool fossils like trilobites. You see a picture of a trilobite down the bottom there. Um, and then at a finer scale, we recognize that particular dinosaurs show up in, in a, a repeated sequence. Uh, and likewise with different kinds of ammonites, things that are living in, in the oceans show up in a particular order and we find them around the world that way. Um, and they can be used as what we call index fossils. They kind of tell us the time in a relative sense, but without actually knowing the exact age. It's the first step. So how do we know the, those time periods and how old they might be? It kind of seems a little like guesswork, but how can we get to the actual numbers of how old something is? Yeah, absolutely. So it, it's a really good question and, and a challenging one to, to explain to audiences, but geologists primarily use a, a wide range of techniques to determine the age of rocks. Usually fossils cannot be directly dated. Um, a good example of a case where you can do that is Labrea tarpets. Uh, you can do carbon dating on, on the bones and the, the leaves, uh, the insects that come out of the rare tarpets because they're less than 50,000 years. That technique works for that age. Um, but so, and sometimes shells can have materials in them that are suitable for dating. But usually, most commonly, our dating comes from looking at volcanic rocks. These could be lavas, these could be ashes from volcanic eruptions around the world. And they contain radioactive components we call isotopes. Those isotopes decay at a, a known rate. And you can look at the ratio of these different isotopes and figure out how long they have been decaying, how long since that process started. Uh, we've done that enough places around the world that we have a really good idea of the ages of the beginnings and the endings of all of these time periods and, and geological eras. And that now allows us to put ages directly onto the fossils. That's fascinating. All that from lava rocks, huh? 
Mm -hmm. That's really cool. Well, now that we have this sort of super skill about knowing how to find out how old something is based on the geologic time scale and you know what period it came from and all this stuff, can we use that to go time traveling? Yeah, let's do that. Let's do that. All right. Well, first stop, the Cambrian. Mm, it's 500 million years ago. And, and so much of uh, North America's earliest geological and fossil history can be traced back to the Cambrian. Um, California, where you and I live, uh, was underwater then. And, you know, we, we see Cambrian rocks all around us in the Mojave Mountains, the Mojave Desert, sorry, the White Inuit Mountains in Northern California, uh, just a few hours drive away from us. Now, we were in the tropics back then. There's a map of, of the world as we know it back in the Cambrian. It's not what you would recognize today. We were in the tropics, but maybe in the Southern Hemisphere, quite warm, and uh, the seas were filled with mysterious creatures. Um, maybe if we go to the next slide, we can see what they look like. There you go. So this is what Bikini Bottom might have looked like 500 million years ago. You've got trilobites and other very strange and long since extinct arthropods crawling around. You've got sponges. Um, it's a very different looking world. Very different from the pictures that we saw at the beginning Absolutely. of Bikini Bottom. <laughs> but I'm sure there are still wonderful characters that live here as well. So speaking personally, I spent a lot of my time at the Natural History Museum. So let's talk about some dinosaurs. That's kind of our bread and butter over there. Um, let's go to the late Cretaceous about 75 million years ago, because I know that there were some dinosaurs living at that time, right? Oh, Justin, I knew dinosaurs would come up. Um, you know, you're right, but there were very few dinosaurs in California where we live. We were underwater, right? And large parts of the North American continent were also flooded. Uh, in fact, we had a, what we call the Western Interior Seaway, a, a sea that extended from the Gulf of Mexico through Texas all the way up to the Arctic and separated North America into uh, Eastern and Western um, subcontinents. We call Laramidia and Appalachia. Now, the dinosaurs you're talking about, they're roaming around on the coastal plains of this, uh, this seaway. Um, and we have a few in California, but for the most part, most of California was underwater. And we have equally cool animals, Justin, like the, the ammonites here. This is my friend, Eupachydiscus, our local giant ammonite, uh, several feet in diameter. And this would have been swimming in the seas and, and what is now Santa Monica. Wow, so no T-Rex in LA. No T-Rex in LA, except at the Natural History Museum and you're always That's welcome true. to come visit. <laughs> That's true. Yeah, and this is a, a scene of what Bikini Bottom would have looked like some 75 million years ago. Lots of strange creatures like these ammonites. Uh, some of them are coiled like the ones we just looked at in the previous slide. Some are kind of straight and, and oriented vertically. Um, we don't really understand how they all lived. It's a very strange ecosystem. Um, and one, geologically speaking, that's not that long ago. So a lot has changed in the last 75 million years. 75 million years, it's kind of a time that's hard to wrap your head around. I think to even count to 75 million years, to count to that number would take I don't know how many months. <laughs> Just, that would take a while. <laughs> yeah. All right. So no dinosaurs. That's okay. I also kind of uh, split my time between Natural History Museum and the La Brea Tar Pits. So maybe we can visit some cool megafauna or big animals like we often find at La Brea Tar Pits or Bikini Bottom Tar Pits. Justin, you have the best job, man. Working with both Thank dinosaurs you. and the La Brea Tar Pits, uh, you know, in Los Angeles, we're blessed to have these places, but tar pits are, are cool and all, but those big furry megafauna, um, they're only part of our Pleistocene story. So the Pleistocene in the last 2 million years um, was a time in which Earth was experiencing these rapid coolings and warmings. Big ice sheets and glaciers were covering the continents of North America and, and uh, Europe and Asia and expanding across Antarctica. And they're melting again. And each time that happens, sea level went up and down and up and down, flooding our world's coastal areas, including where we live in Los Angeles. Yeah. And in fact, this is what Los Angeles would have looked like 120,000 years ago with one of those flooding events. 
Uh, the green dot in there is the Labrea Tarpits. So that didn't exist quite then. Uh, our, our fairy friends were, were in the hills looking down on this beautiful bay. Uh, the Natural History Museum itself would also have been underwater. But 20,000 years ago, sea level drops and we have this big, wide, open coastal plain. And that's when the animals that we see today at Labrea Tarpits really have their time in the sun. Wow, I mean, 20,000 years, I can sort of get my head around that, but still 75 million years is, is a little nuts to me. Well, yeah. let's talk about some fossils today, something a little bit more contemporary. Yeah, yeah. So I, I like to think about the effect that fossils have had on, on us every day, right? And, and one example of that are those, those plankton that were living 10 to 15 million years ago they sent vast quantities of organic material, those nutrients to the seafloor, um, forming big thick rocks. We call those diatomite, the full of diatoms. These are marine algae kind of plankton. And over time with heat and pressure as these rocks are being buried under Los Angeles under thousands and thousands of feet of, of mud and sand, they get converted to oil, oil and gas. And we owe so much in the city that we live to the economic and, and prosperity that, that came from the discovery of oil in the city. So I think we have a lot to be thankful for from fossils. And uh, it all goes back to plankton. Wow. Plankton's kind of important. So, I mean, this is just kind of blowing my mind a little bit. First, that rock, diatomite, mm -hmm. is made up of sea creatures. 100% sea creatures. And what's cool about it, Justin, you hold up a piece of this rock and it's going to leave white powder all over you. And of course, the first thing you're going to do is like wipe it on your clothes, right? Well, you've mm -hmm. just smeared thousands and millions of little microscopic fossils all over your clothes. Happens every time I give a kid one of these rocks. Wow. Guaranteed. And, and so when we hear the term like fossil fuels, right, this is what we're talking about. It's not like we're putting you know, long dead dinosaurs in our car, it's more so. No, we're not, we're not shoveling dinosaurs into a, a refinery. It, it all comes back to this ancient organic material, the plankton that was in the water column, yeah. Well, well, it's really special that we can use this knowledge of, of geologic time scales and geologic time to understand how old something is or to have a better idea of what kind of world it occupied. That's a something I didn't really know too much about in terms of how yeah. we date things. So I'm feeling very inspired with this kind of new knowledge about geologic time. How can I, or can I even find a fossil? How can I find out more about ancient marine creatures and environments on my own for myself? Yeah. yeah. Well, first off, come and visit us at the Natural History Museum, brand new yeah. exhibit, Los Angeles Underwater. And you can see many of the fossils that have been found around our city uh, and also explore your neighborhood. We have an interactive map and you can search up where you live and see what's been found around you. And that will tell you that fossils have been found everywhere around the city. But throughout North America, uh, we have a very rich paleontological heritage. Um, and everybody can do this. Everybody can be a scientist, can be a paleontologist. Uh, fossils are found at construction sites. I was actually at a construction site this morning before I came to join you at a school digging up 120,000 year old seashells. It was really, really cool. And the construction workers loved it. Um, but we can find them along our coastlines, along our beaches and cliffs and in and parks around, uh, around our great city. So yeah, everyday Angelinas and, and anybody uh, on this continent can find fossils. Wow, that's pretty inspiring. So thank you so much for all that amazing information, Dr. Hendy. Now, I know we'll both be sticking around. We have some time to answer some questions. So I'm going to check the chat and uh, see if we have any, any uh, questions. But yeah, you did mention the LA Underwater exhibit. Definitely just speaking as even if I didn't work at the museum, it is so so cool to see all these things that may have been living you know where you're sitting right now essentially it's it's really mind-blowing yeah and you know uh, we chose we chose many of those specimens justin because they have good stories 
They were found by folks just going about their lives in gardens, digging, digging trenches in a, in a farm. Um, so yeah, it, it really speaks to how much is out there and, and the important contributions that everyday people can, can make when they find these things and they report them to a, a museum like ours. I'm tempted, Dr. Handy, to just go and start digging in my front yard. And if I get any heat from it, uh, you know, blaming it on you. So <laughs> we, we do have a question in the chat. Um, do you personally go out to collect fossils? I, I do. Yep. I had to get up at seven o'clock this morning to, to beat the heat and be back in time for this presentation. So I was collecting clams and snails and, and, uh, in my own town where I live, and it, it, you know, it tells you that that even where I live today was once a, a shallow sea. Um, sometimes we do field expeditions. We'll go away for several days or weeks at a time, and we'll be camping, uh, usually in more remote places, and doing a lot of hiking and carrying big rocks on our backs. Um, so yeah, we 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 do field work for sure. That's cool. the funnest part of the job. Yeah. So another question we have in the chat is from Andrea Kim. How old are the items and how do you find them? And also how many hours or days do you work? I thought, I thought you were asking how many hours a day do I work? Um, <laughs> a lot because I'm very passionate about what I do. Um, so let's see, the older, you know, I, I tend to work on very young fossils, the ones from the Pleistocene, the last couple million years. Uh, I find those most interesting because I want to understand a little bit more about where today's marine environment came from. And that helps me inform how it may change in the future. So those most recent fossils are really important for understanding a little bit more about our present world and, and what it might face in the future. Um, so those are my favorite fossils to work on. I have dug up a dinosaur skeleton before. That's probably the most important thing I've done is if you ask my kids. Um, and I think the oldest fossils I dug up are 500 million year old trilobites. Wow. And, uh, you know, that they don't look anything like the ones that we, that we, uh, were looking at this morning, the, the way different animals. Wow. Uh, that's really cool. Here's a question that um, I can answer. Are there fossils you can touch in the museum? Yes, there are some dinosaur fossils that you can touch at the Natural History Museum. Uh, I'm not sure if we have any marine fossils. We have that big replica of that giant ammonite, I believe, was found in Germany. Mm -hmm. um, so yes, there are fossils that you can, real fossils you can touch at the Natural History Museum. Here's an um, idea for folks who okay. live in Los Angeles. You go down to the Natural History Museum to the Los Angeles Underwater Exhibit. And there is a megalodon tooth that you can touch and get a sense of how big one of those teeth was. And then we have animated creatures, including the megalodon, that swim around, are projected on the walls of the exhibit. And you can take a selfie with the megalodon creeping up behind you. It's, it's pretty big. That's awesome. So we have a few more questions. Um, and this one is cool because it can talk to that new digital initiative about the did I find a fossil that's um, highlighted in in yeah. LA underwater. So the question is from Catherine and she says, if I find a fossil, can I bring it to the museum to find out what kind it is? You sure can. What we'd love for you to do is follow our, our new instructions on what to do when you find something cool like that and you wanna know more. We want you to go through a series of steps and uh, which are the steps we do as a scientist, right? So we're, we're training you to sort of follow the process that we follow we want to know where you found it. We want, would love for you to take a photo of it with a scale bar, different angles, um, and tell us a little bit about the context of, of where it was. You know, was it just lying on a track or did it come out of a cliff? You know, things like that can be very informative for helping you figure out what kind of fossil you have. Is it even a fossil? But sometimes we're, we're tricked by things that look pretty cool, but aren't. And, then also, you know, we might be able to tell you how old it is and, and a little bit of information. We like to turn these opportunities and, into teaching moments, right? And, uh, and we can learn from your fossils and, and you can learn from your own discoveries. Yeah. So in the chat, Susie, who does work with us, um, yeah. she posted the link. It's called right. Your Fossil Discovery. You can also type in Natural History Museum, 
your fossil discovery. And it'll tell you those steps that our paleontologists and our um, excavators go through to determine, is this even a fossil? So that is a very helpful first step and it's accessible to anyone. Um, here is a question from Avery. Has a megalodon been found in Los Angeles? Avery, good question. Um, yes, yes. We do find the occasional megalodon teeth. Um, they're not so common. You can go to other places where you can find them more commonly, like in Bakersfield uh, or in Florida or even in the Carolinas. Um, but they are found occasionally, and particularly in the cliffs around where I live, the Palos Verdes Peninsula. We can also find them offshore. It's kind of crazy. But if you go and dredge the seafloor just off the coast of San Pedro, uh, you are dredging up 15 million year old rocks that contain a lot of bones and, and uh, teeth. So we found megalodon teeth out there as well. Wow. So this one's from Marcel. It's about sharks. Can the color of a shark's tooth I find on the beach tell you how old it is? Why are some dark colored and why are some light colored? Yeah, you know, I'm, I'm no expert on sharks. I'm getting a lot of shark questions right now, but uh, generally the color of the shark tooth is related to the sediment that it was found in, right? So they, they tend to absorb the minerals that are in the water that's flowing through those rocks. There's always between all the grains of sand and mud, there's water flowing through those rocks and they're carrying with them minerals and they can stain the fossils black, um, particularly in places that are low oxygen environments like swampy waters, um, or they can make them bright red or, or gray. Um, so usually it has more to do with the rocks that they're coming out of than their age. Hmm. So this is a question from Kay. Kay Han asks, where can I find fossils in California? Start at the museum. That's the best place to go. So you, you learn a little bit about our fossil history. Um, and then I would also take a look at a geological map. Uh, they're actually surprisingly accessible. So you can go and Google USGS, that's the US Geological Survey, geological maps. And it's a very user-friendly system to explore the geology of your local area. You wanna find sedimentary rocks. Those are ones that were laid down usually in a marine environment, but sometimes on land or in lakes and rivers. And um, that would give you some context. How old am I digging in? At what kind of environments? Um, and so that's a good place to start. But generally, coastlines that are eroding where there's cliffs and there's rocks falling down the beach, don't, don't get crushed by a rock, be safe always. Um, some places there are quarries where you can go and collect. Um, for example, out in Bakersfield, Shark Tooth Hill, there are commercial quarries there that you can collect in. Uh, and then in much younger rocks, like the ones that I study, you know, there are outcrops all around uh, our city where there's construction sites and parks. Always want to get permission, make sure you're allowed to collect in those places, but they can be, you know, really fun little adventures to, to go and see what you can find. So a couple more cool questions. Um, this one's from Nate. Are there any animals with genetic similarities with ancient animals that you're finding out there? Uh, well, the most youngest fossil record that I work on, almost everything is still alive today. So well, that actually makes it really easy to interpret what kind of environments it was in, but also what, what changes in environment have taken place between then and, and now. So, so mostly fairly similar creatures. If we go back to our Cretaceous time period, it gets a little bit harder. Most of those animals are extinct. Uh, ammonites, for example, and I think they're a particularly fun group. They come in so many wacky and weird shapes and sizes, and we really have to think hard about how those animals lived, how they interacted with each other, how they interacted with the environment, because we don't have a good modern analog. So that's a really good question, yeah. So I think we'll have time for two more. First is, would there be a way to tell the difference between a recently lost shark's tooth and one that was fossilized? A recent fossil tooth and one that was fossilized. Um, 
Yeah, so, so usually recent fossils, um, doesn't matter if it's a tooth or a shell or a bone, has slightly different texture. It, it may feel lighter, may have different colors. Um, so for example, modern seashells usually have color patterns on them. Fossil ones usually bleached or they've lost their color patterns. Um, and, and likewise with teeth, I think, you know, most modern teeth are kind of a, uh, you know, a white color, fairly, fairly bleached, you know, you know nice clean teeth. Um, whereas the fossil ones may be more amber, gray, black, um, things like that. And they may have kind of a, a heavier feel to them. This, there may have been some mineralization going on. Okay, because a, a fossil is, most of the time it's rock, right? So it might be a little heavier just in general? Correct. Broadly yeah. speaking, okay. Yeah, you know, and, and to be a fossil, you don't have to have been replaced. It's, it's an arbitrary term. We say old than 10,000 years, mm -hmm. and it is a fossil. And, and that means it could look like something fairly recent, um, or it could look very, very fossilized. Um, so preservation is usually a good indicator, but preservation does not make it a fossil. Okay. So something to keep in mind. So this question is about uh, you, Dr. Hendy. If, uh -oh. if any of the participants are, are thusly inspired and want to kind of pursue a career in invertebrate paleontology or just marine mammals, um, the questions were, how long have you studied them and how long have you worked for the museum? Mm. How did you how did you end up here? Oh gosh, well, this is gonna date me. Um let's see, I, I finished high school 27 years ago now. Um and so then I went to university and I would say to become Dr. Austin, that, that took you know about 10 years. So 10 years of academic training, keeping on going to school. Although school to become a, a doctor scientist it's different it's different it's it's more about your research and your curiosity and your your interest in learning and and you know asking and answering questions than it is about taking tests and, and things like that so i i really enjoyed that process um and then i spent a, a lot of time traveling around to different museums and, and learning how things are done uh, before I came out here to Los Angeles. I've been out here for seven or eight years now and, and really love working at this institution. It's an amazing place and an amazing location to, to be a paleontologist. There is so much to learn about the, the rocks and animals that, that live around us. So Neat. good question. Thank you. So fine, I did lie to you. Now these are our last two. Uh, do, uh, you ever, do you ever include students in your work? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. We love to, well, students of all ages, right? Um, I, I always say anybody can be a scientist, little kids through to, you know, um, much older people with a lot of wisdom and experience uh, can participate in the scientific process. So we will often take uh, fossil digs to schools uh, to allow young minds to explore what we do as a, as a, a job. Um, and yes, we, we take uh, high school students sometimes and a lot of university students uh, into our collections and into the field to, to work alongside us and, and learn about what we do and, and do research with us. I really like that. Anyone can be a scientist. It's not all about lab coats and, yeah. you know, PhDs, but anyone can be a scientist. Absolutely. Yeah. All right. So last question, and this seems to be a very important one. What does the fossil record tell us about the rate of climate change over time compared to how it's going on today? Yeah, that, that's a very significant question. So the fossil record, the geological record really offers us the opportunity to learn about our context. What has happened before human uh, modification of our environment and what we find when we look at indicators of past climate um, is that our climatic change that we're experiencing right now is happening at a very fast rate, much, much faster. In fact, it's speeding up since we started measuring it. Um, so you, one can argue that, well, maybe the fossil record isn't, isn't so 
reliable to look at, but even among our historical uh, measurements, machine measurements of various uh, atmospheric and oceanographic indicators, we see that um, things are, are rapidly changing. And so that's quite alarming. But the fossil record tells us about what has been the natural state in the past. And we know that climates change in the past. I, I showed you that in today's presentation with the ice sheets expanding and contracting. That tends to happen at a much slower rate uh, than we're seeing today. Um, so it's really important to, to have that con context. Um, and also to be able to go back in time to times when it will look a little bit more like what it's gonna look in the future, right? We're warming our, our climate, we're making the oceans more acidic. Mm -hmm. And there are periods in Earth's history when it's been like that before. Now, we weren't around then. Other creatures were around and, and they didn't like it so much, right? So we, a number of our mass extinctions are associated with ocean acidification. So it, the fossil record does give us a glimpse into some of the potential problems that we're going to encounter in the future. That's a good question. I'm glad folks are thinking about that. Yeah, very important question. Well, friends, that just about wraps up our Q&A segment as well as our webinar. Thank you again. Thank you so much, Dr. Austin Handy, for chatting with us today about your own uh, travels through time and helping us learn about how fossils can really be our ticket to explore ancient as well as our modern worlds. So once again, thank you, Dr. Handy, and thank you also to Nickelodeon for helping us host this event. We've been hosting these all month and it's really been fantastic. Of course, there is more science of SpongeBob. There's videos, there's activities, there's virtual events to explore at nhm.org slash SpongeBob. It's in the chat right there. So thank you all for tuning in and I hope you have a great rest of your day. Thank you so much.